Luke 22, 36 through 38. I just want to share this passage with you. It's really interesting, and it's been misapplied by a lot of people, and hopefully, uh, I, I bet Ashley's version is going to beat us all to the punch, though. We'll see what happens, because hers usually has a pretty good paraphrase. Okay, 36. He says, But now whoever has a money belt is to take it along, likewise also a bag, and whoever has no sword is to sell his coat and buy one. For I tell you that this which is written must be fulfilled in me, and he was numbered with transgressors, for that which refers to me has its fulfillment. Now, Jesus here in verses 36 and 37 is, he's referring back to what he had told them, uh, you know, what he, what he had told them before, you know, that whenever they were to go out, they were just to go out. They, they weren't to carry anything with them. But now he tells them to go get, uh, get a money bag and, um, and a, a money belt and a bag and to go get, a, and if he doesn't have a sword, to go and to sell their, their coat or their outer garment and to purchase a sword. Now, what he's talking about in verse 37, what you find is he is telling them that they're about to go to war not in a literal sense with an actual sword, but spiritually speaking. There's about to be great distress and persecution and all this. And so he's pre preparing their minds for action, is what another passage says. So here's what the disciples do in verse 38. They take what Jesus said literally, and they said, Lord, look, here are two swords. And notice what Jesus says back to them. It is enough. Now, whenever we read that in our English translations, and the way I've heard that, you know, been taught before. He says, well, that'll do. That's enough. Like, you know what I mean? They, they act like it's uh, passages that teaches Jesus is saying, yeah, two swords will be just fine. But that expression, it is enough, really what it means is uh, some versions say, translate it, stop, no more of this. Uh, like it is uh, basically cut it out, you know, like it's enough. Actually, what does yours say? That's enough. Well, that's enough. That sounds more like. But we read it like, it's enough. That's good. Instead of, that's enough, you know. Enough of this. Enough of this. There we go. Now go down a little bit, and you'll see something similar. Uh, he says in Luke chapter 22, verse 49 through 51, uh, when those who were around him saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? Why did they ask that? Because they just said we had two of them, right? And so then one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus answered and said, stop, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. And then, as you know from the other passage in Matthew, the one I was thinking of a while ago, he talks about if you take, take up the sword, you die by the sword. So he wasn't telling them to take two swords around, you know, on their missionary journeys. He was preparing them for battle. Uh, in, in the spiritual sense, as Jesus often communicated to his disciples. And they misunderstood that. And he said, that's enough, or cut it out, or knock it off. You know, So a lot of people misread that passage because of the way that it's translated. Depending on how, on how you inflect it, it could go either way You know, in, in our inflection. But what a lot of people who have all these letters by their name point out is that that's a, uh, that's a reference to an Old Testament, to a couple of Old Testament passages, where at least where the same language is used, where God basically said, cut it out, that's enough, stop it, right? So, uh, just wanted to share that with you, especially in light of some of the discussions that have been going on in this political uh, climate. Okay, in uh, John chapter 1, let's go there now, let's get started in our study this evening. In John chapter 1 and verse 1, we read this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay. What we need to first do is keep in mind this definition of Word, W-O-R-D, which is from a Greek word, logos. Some people pronounce it logos, but... Uh, I, as far as I can tell, it should be pronounced logos from the studies that I've done. And this word is going to be used throughout the book of John. This word, word, is going to be used throughout the book of John. And if we don't keep in mind Jesus' use of it in John 1.1, 1, 1, or rather John's use of it in relation to Jesus in John 1.1, 1, 1, then we're going to lose track of how that word is being used throughout the rest of the book. So we got to 
Remember that. He says, in the beginning was the Word. And when you think about Genesis chapter 1, because it's obvious here from John 1, 1 that he's referring to, to Genesis 1, because Genesis 1 begins, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. Uh, the Gospel of Mark also begins this way, in the beginning. And so there's an obvious callback to the book of Genesis here in John 1, 1. And so the Word that's in mind you go back to uh, Genesis, this is word spoken over and over. It's the creative word of God. Let, you know, let there be, let there be. Uh, it's this creative force. Jesus, rather, God speaks the world into existence. So in, Je in uh, John 1, 1, he says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, that is, through the word. And apart from, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. So from the very beginning, Jesus has been. He pre-existed before his incarnation, is what people call it. Before he was born to Mary, he existed. And he, as God, brought the world into existence. Now, um, all these questions people ask, how did Jesus die if he was God and things like that? Well, the solution to that, uh, Paul talks about that in Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, here's what he said that Jesus did when he took on flesh. Have this attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, although existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, or uh, King James Version talks about uh, robbery, a thing to be held on to, a thing to be taken for himself. But instead, what he did with his equality with God is he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. And he did that, as you see in verse 8, so that, he could, uh, so that he could die and so that he could be raised. Now, Jesus did not stay in that, what he called the humbled state, the humbled himself. He didn't stay in that state, but upon his resurrection, according to John chapter 17, Here's what uh, he says here concerning his, him, himself. Now, Father, this is verse 5 of John 17. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. So when Jesus became a man, when he took on flesh, as John 1.14 says, he gave up all of the... Uh, properties of God that we typically attribute to God. For example, omnipresence. You know, Jesus was contained in a flesh and blood body, right? Uh, the wise men had to go to Bethlehem to see him. They couldn't just, you know, look around and see him, right? Uh, you, look, you think about omniscience, that is all-knowing. Jesus wasn't all-knowing because he said concerning uh, the coming of the Lord, he said, of that day and hour, no man knows, no, not the Son, but the Father only. And Jesus was also not omnipotent in and of himself when he was in the flesh because it wasn't until his resurrection that he said, all power has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. Instead, when he was on earth, as what you see is, uh, especially when we're going to get to John 14 through 16, he would ask the Father and the Father would give to him. And the Spirit came on him in Luke chapter 4 when he began his ministry. And so uh, Jesus gave up things concerning his uh, deity whenever he became a man. But he returned to those things, at least it seems from John 17, verse 5, upon his resurrection and then subsequent uh, ascension. Because in the resurrection accounts of Jesus, Jesus is doing all kinds of things. Uh, going through walls into locked rooms, appearing here and appearing there, you know. And uh, he appears to Paul on the road to Damascus. And so post-resurrection Jesus has these qualities that pre-resurrection Jesus uh, did not have for the moment. He had to put off those things so that he could die, but that did not make him any less God. Go for it. Uh, it occurs to me. Sure. Um, on the Mount of Transfiguration. Yes. That he did take on his glory. His glory That's right. Experience. He did. So there is Right. And he indicates. I will say that defying the laws of physics, 
were times that he did. Well, For instance, when he walked on the water. Sure. Well, in those instances, Peter walked on water, but he didn't take on a glorified state. Yeah, but it was a miracle, uh, you know. And we can talk about the we can talk about that sort of thing, but uh, plenty of people in the Old Testament did miracles and things mm-hmm. like that. Um, my point is that Jesus did not maintain an equality with God the Father when he took on flesh for the purpose of death. It wasn't until he was resurrected and then subsequently ascended, that he was returned to that former glory that he had before the world began. So what would that have been, the transfiguration? Well, the transfiguration was a picture of his power and coming, as Peter said in Second Peter chapter 1. The transfiguration was a picture of that glory, in other words. It was a revelation to his disciples as to who he was for sure, once and for all. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, then they ended up not believing anyways, but, you know... Johnny? Okay. Um, so in uh, Philippians, oh, sorry. And so in John chapter 1, we have here the doctrine of the pre existence of Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Again, let's call back to the book of Genesis. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Now, this setup here in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, uh, calling back to Genesis, is going to prepare our minds to see various sets of seven within the book of John. There are seven I am statements where he calls back to Exodus whenever uh, God talked to Abraham through the bush and he said, who do, who do I need to tell him sends me? And he said, I am sent you. So there's seven of those I am statements, but there's also seven I am the blank statements. I am the bread of life. I am the door. I am the way. Okay. Uh, there's also seven signs that Jesus performs prior to his death. We'll look at those as we had before. So we're going to keep our eye out for these sevens, and we're going to use, you know, we're going to do our best to keep track of stuff to kind of keep up with them. If I remember right, there's seven women, uh, women disciples. There are seven questions that Pilate asks Jesus and John. So we'll kind of keep track of all those as we go through. But the purpose of all these sets of seven is to keep in our mind the Genesis account that's, that's behind this book. Because in John 1.1, 1, 1, he starts off the whole thing, in the beginning. And so as we read through the book of John, we're supposed to have something to do with Genesis in our mind. And whenever we get to the very last couple of chapters of John, when Jesus is resurrected, where is his tomb located? What sort of area is his tomb located in? What kind of area? What's yeah, sure. What kind of area? Uh, was it in a field? Was it on a mountainside? What, what, was it in a garden? What was it in a valley? In a garden. Now, after... after Calling back to the book of Genesis so many times. Yeah. He's, he's in John chapter 20, when we're talking about the resurrection of Jesus, he mentions that he was in a garden when he was resurrected, but then he does another thing to make sure that we know that he's talking about a garden. What does he do with Martha? Or uh, Mary Magdalene, sorry. I, th- I think my, my brain scrambled. But anyways, who did she think that he was? She thought he was the gardener. Now, why is he doing that? Because he's trying to remind you, he was in a garden, he's in a garden, right? So what the book of John is, is a retelling of uh, the book of Genesis, the beginning. The book of John is the telling of a new creation. Instead of Adam, it's Jesus. Instead of death, we have life, right? And so Jesus is retelling the story here in the book of John through his ministry. And all the signs that he performs and all that he does goes into that. Now, here's something else that you need to know um, whenever we are studying the book of John. In the book of Exodus, Moses lays out the tabernacle plans. How many sections of the tabernacle plans were there? If you just had to guess a number. Seven. Seven which means that in the design of the tabernacle and even on the artwork and the things that they had in the tabernacle, 
It was all to remind the people of creation. So one of the other things that we're going to see throughout the book of John, one of the very first things Jesus does is he runs people out of the temple and then says, destroy it in three, you know, destroy it and I'll build it again in three days. And then you see what happens in three days is he's resurrected. So what's he, what's he also doing in here? He's not just bringing about a new creation. He's bringing about a new tabernacle, a new temple, uh, a new way of approaching God, a way that they hadn't, they hadn't approached God before. Uh, and that's the discussion that he has with the woman at the well in John chapter 4. Johnny? Sure. And he had told them to destroy this temple, he had to build up. Yes. Did it say that he was speaking of his body? It did. Yeah. Uh, John 3. Temple. They took it to mean that he was speaking about the temple. Oh, yeah, yeah. But he's, uh, so Jesus, is, so Paul talks about Jesus being the cornerstone of the new temple. And we're built, and Peter talks about we're built up as spiritual stones on that cornerstone as the temple of God. So what he's doing is, through his death, he's destroying the temple in a sense, and through his resurrection, he's starting a new temple, right? So he's rendering ineffective the one in order to establish the new. And these temple themes and temple imagery are going to be used uh, throughout the book of John, and we're going to kind of keep track of those as well, uh, just so we have it all, you know, just so we got the book where, it, you know, uh, in a way like the old original readers would have would have understood it so we have this creation set up in John chapter 1 1 through 3 to get that into our brains and then he says this in verse 4 in him that is in Christ was life and the life was the light of men another interesting call back to Genesis chapter 1 about light versus darkness. Here's what he says about the light. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So Jesus came offering life, and he came offering light, and the two are used uh, as synonyms here, or it's just two different ways of saying the same thing. And uh, he says that even though he was a light shining in the darkness, they did not comprehend it. He's going to return to this theme, of course, in John chapter 3 when he's having a discussion with Nicodemus about life uh, and light and darkness and good and evil. So, they did not comprehend what Jesus came to do because they stayed in darkness, which means they did not comprehend the type of life that Jesus was coming to offer. And so, this, uh, this theme here of comprehension, as you see in verse 5, or understanding, um, explaining, as we're going to see on down here in verse, I believe it's verse 18 or so. This theme of uh, revealing and understanding and comprehending is something that's going to go throughout the entire book, because throughout the book, Jesus has these conversations with people about certain spiritual uh, elements, like, uh, like the new birth, being born from above, like bread. Uh, like resurrection, all these sorts of things. He's going to have these conversations with the people throughout the book, and one thing is always common in, in those different situations. The person to whom he's speaking originally misunderstands what he's saying until he explains it, and then they have the option to accept his explanation or to reject it. And that usually determines whether or not they are a, uh, abiding in light or abiding in darkness. For example... You had the woman at the well. She accepts the interpretation and goes and gets the whole town. Whereas uh, the Jesus' disciples in John chapter 6, when he explains to them what the bread of life is, they reject him and, and go away. So some people in this are going to accept it. Other people are going to reject it. The people that accept it understand, to some degree, even if not fully, the nature of the kingdom and the nature of the work that Jesus came to do. But the people that reject it don't understand. For example, in John chapter 6, when Jesus is talking to the people about, uh, about the bread of life, one of the things that they wanted to do was take and force him to be king. See, they're not being able to understand the nature of the kingdom that Jesus came to set up. 
uh, was connected to them not being able to understand the sort of strange language to them that Jesus used talking about himself and his work. So you have these misunderstandings all throughout the book uh, connected to one another. And so there's a lot being introduced here in verses 1 through 5 that we wouldn't catch if we didn't sort of slow down and kind of use this as an opportunity to give a brief overview of John as a whole. So uh, he says, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Um, light, as I mentioned a second ago, is, an is another way that he talks about life. And life and light are used uh, in the Old Testament to talk about extending salvation to a certain people. Uh, like, for example, in the book of Isaiah, oops, let's see, uh oh. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 49 and verse. Uh, six, he says this. You, he says, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up, notice that, to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. So, light in the Old Testament, like for example here in Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 6 is synonymous with salvation, which we see in John 1 is synonymous with life. So being raised up, being restored, having the light shine on you, uh, uh, attaining salvation, all these different things are connected, and they're connected through in the prophets, and they're connected in John's writings. So we got to keep some of that in mind as we go through. So whenever John the apostle writes in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7 and says, If you walk in the light... What's he saying? He's saying if you walk in the life, uh, if you live a, a, a life of life, not a life of death, right? If you lay hold of life and not lay hold of death. So when we begin reading in John's writings and we see these words like light, life, darkness, death being used, we can start to see patterns and how they're related to one another. So in John chapter 14 and verse 6, when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, He's saying, I'm the way, the truth, and the light. You can read it like that. Um, by the way, when Jesus says, I am the way, what's he the way to? To God. To, God, to, the, to the Father, to the presence of God. Now, in Genesis, I'm kind of giving you away all the secrets of my study of John before we even get there. But in Genesis, whenever Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden garden, okay, what does God do to keep them from coming back? Cherubim with the sword and the flaming sword, okay, and where does he put it? All right, Genesis chapter uh, 3 says he put it in the way. So whenever Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, not the lie that the devil told, and the life, not the death that Adam and Eve brought in. He is making references back to Genesis. See, the entire book, if you're familiar with Genesis 1 through 3, the entire book's going to make a lot of sense to you because of all these callbacks to Genesis 1 through 3. So this, is a, this book is about a reversal of what was introduced through the lie, is what Jesus says in John 8, that Satan told in uh, uh, Genesis chapter 3. And so this... These themes of comprehension, light, death, life, darkness, lie, truth, it all goes back to the book of, uh, to the book of Genesis. And then we're going to see how big of a deal that is whenever we, can, whenever we continue through the book. Uh, another thing that John's going to lean heavily on, as we've already started to see, uh, is the prophets, which is no surprise to any of us. But we've already seen how he leans heavily on Isaiah about these themes of light and life. And whenever, you, uh, whenever we get into the very first miracle that Jesus performed, was turning water to wine, right? That's also a reference to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 1. But we'll notice that when we get there, all right? Let's continue on here in uh, John chapter 1 and verse 6. Okay. 
So we have this little introduction here, verses 1 through 5, to get us ready uh, to understand the rest of the book with all these references to the prophets, to Genesis, to uh, the tabernacle, as we're going to see in a little bit. He says, There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. So, pretty simple introduction here. Uh, John has arrived, and he has come as, a, as one that would go before the light, to testify of the light. And as we're about to see, as we get on down in this passage, John is going to be the, the fulfillment of two different Old Testament passages uh, that are, he has in mind here. Isaiah 40 and Malachi 3 and 4. Uh, let's go back to Isaiah 40 for just a second because I want to show you something in Isaiah chapter 40 to sort of set, our, uh, set, set the stage for the ministry of John. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1. He says, Comfort, O comfort my people, says your God. Speak kindly to Jerusalem and call out to her that her warfare has ended, that her iniquity has been removed, that she has received of the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. Uh, that should remind you of Revelation 18, by the way. A voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up, every mountain and hill be made low. Let the rough ground become a path and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all flesh will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Okay, so we have here in Isaiah chapter 40 this prophecy about John's ministry. And John's ministry was going to be a time, uh, it was going to be a thing that would predict judgment, a thing that would predict salvation, and a thing that would predict a time when all flesh would see the glory of the Lord. Or, as John the Apostle said in uh Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7, every eye would see him. There's no difference between saying all flesh would see the glory of the Lord and every eye would see him. It's essentially the same phrase. So John's ministry that we're about to read here in verses 6 and following is based in Isaiah chapter 40, a time of salvation, a time of judgment, a time of wiping away sins, a time of the revelation of God's glory. And what is a word that you might use to talk about uh, when you think of revelation and glory, you might use the word light, right? Shining the light on it. Uh, you think of radiance of the sun, and sun emits light. So there is a, there is a uh, strong connection, at least what I see here, between the light of Jesus, who is revealing who God is, and the revelation of the glory to all flesh in Isaiah chapter 40. But we'll see more of that as we move through the passage. Okay, uh, verse 9. There was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. Hey, there's the birthday boy. One year old. Did he get a good nap? Good, yeah, he was, man, he was in a mood today. Hey, so happy to see everybody. Look at us. All right, there was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. Notice that uh, word true there, as opposed to false. So, again, you have this setting up here of true versus false, darkness versus light, uh, you know, life versus death. And he says that the true light, which comes into the world, enlightens every man. Now, we're going to see what that does in John chapter 3. For some... When you shine the light on it, it looks good. Some, when you shine the light on, light on it, things are exposed. Things don't look good. A good example of that is sometimes when I give Caden baby food, uh, our, our, the lights in our dining room used to be kind of dim until we bought these different kind of bulbs, and they're just way better than what we had. And uh, I would wipe off his face real good, and I'd look at it, and I'd say, okay, that's about right. And then I'd take him out into the sun, 
in his little carrier, and he just has food all over his face. And I'm going, oh, what in the world? So light, true light, the sun, does what my <laughs> lights in the dining room used to not be able to do, and that is expose what's going on. And so one of the things that Jesus is going to do in his ministry is he's going to expose a lot of filthiness in and among the people. Uh, that's one of the first things he does in John chapter 2 is he goes into the temple, causes all kinds of havoc because of the, uh, just, uh, because of the way that they were taking advantage of all the people in there. And we're going to see that throughout his ministry. Okay. He was in the world, verse 10, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. Okay, so a couple of things there in verse 10 and verse 11. <clears throat> the word world that he uses there is going to be a big word for us in this, uh, in this book. Because when you read that word world, if you just read this word by itself without any context, you think of the earth, right? But whenever he says world here, Notice what he says. He was in the world. The world was made through him. The world did not know him. Right there. The world did not know him. Then he says this. He came to his own. Those who were his own. And those who were his own did not receive him. So his own here is the same thing as what he's talking about here. The world. So there's an identification in John between the world and the Jewish people of Jesus' day. There is a correlation between the world and the Jewish people. More specifically, though, not really the Jewish people, uh, but the covenant that they were in, the world that they were in. And as we're going to go through the book of John, we're going to see this word world is used throughout the book, talking about, he's going to talk about things that are below uh, versus things that are above. So I'm just introducing all this to you, as John is, so that you can keep track of all this as we go through the book. Uh, so, the world did not know him. He's not talking about the flowers and the trees and the mountains and the air. He's talking about the people, what he calls his own in verse 11. Now, uh, the word own, as you might can kind of guess, if, and you can see it here, uh, is the word possession, what he, his, his people, the people that he possessed. And the people that, God, that were God's own possession, to start with, were the Jewish people, the descendants of Abraham. So he came into that world, that realm, and that realm rejected him. However, he says this in verse 12, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of of God, even to those or to those who believe in his name. So stop right there for a moment. So you have a group of people here that were given the right to become a children of God because of their faith in him. And we're going to read about these people throughout the book of John. But these people are not, uh, although they're part of this group, the world, and his own. They had to come out of that group to become children of God. And we're going to see that uh, as, we, as we move on through the book. They had to be born of above. Ashley? Oh, okay. I don't know. I probably don't understand it the same way you're saying it. Because from verse 10 to 11, what I'm getting his own will be the Jewish yes. people. And then, but then verse 12 is like referring to whoever receives it. Right, so, okay. in the book of John, we have people that are not of the Jews that accept Jesus, and we'll see that. Um, he says this in verse 13. This is a big verse, too, because this, uh, this sets up John chapter 3 for us. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So you look at the children of Israel. Um, 
and you look at who is allowed to go into the temple, we all know this, we've talked about it before, that was dependent upon who your mom and dad were, right? This, in other words, that was dependent upon the flesh, flesh and blood. So whenever G, uh, Paul talks about flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven, like in 1 Corinthians 15, he's using flesh and blood in this same way. You can't enter the kingdom of heaven if you're not born again, if you're not born of above, if you're not born as a child of God. If you're still depending upon flesh and blood, it's not going to work. If you're still in the world, it's not going to work. So here's some words that we have that are used um, similarly through John. We have the word world. We have the word uh, his own. The expression his own. And now we have this expression, flesh and blood. So, all these, these three different words here are used to talk about the same idea, the same thing. Let me show an example of this. Go to Romans chapter 1 real quick. And uh, we'll look at verse 4, I believe it is. Oh, sorry, verse 3, then verse 4. He says this, this uh, gospel is... <clears throat> Concerning his son, who is born of a descendant of David, according to the flesh. According to the flesh. Meaning that Jesus had every right to the throne of David because of who his parents were. However, he says this in verse 4. That he was declared to be the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit. Uh according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. So notice the expression, according to the flesh, contrasted with according to the spirit. This is a big theme in John, as we're going to see. Things that are according to the flesh, you might define according to the flesh as things that can be brought about through man's abilities or man's power, versus things according to the spirit, which refer more to heavenly things. So a kingdom that's according to the flesh is one that picks up the sword. A kingdom that's according to the Spirit is not going to pick up the sword, as Jesus talks about in his uh, questions with Pilate. So, back to this, uh, back to this in John chapter 1. When we see born of flesh and blood, as he even says here, will of man, right? But instead, they can be born of the will of God. Okay. Anybody have any questions on John chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 13? Are you excited to study the book of John? Yeah, it's kind of interesting because I had started reading it like with a group. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Because you know, when we talk about like I just use sports because sports is so easy to talk about. But if we talk about, I could say the sentence. Uh, you know, I can ask a question or whatever. I, I could say this. I said this was a lot like Florida State season. Okay, that doesn't mean anything to somebody who has no idea about anything to do with Florida State and their basketball, baseball, football season, whatever's under discussion. But if they know, if they're a fan of that team, they know every game that was played. They know all the stats. They know all the players. They know the drama that was going on among the players. They know who the coach is, who the coach isn't, who it could be, who it might not be later, you know. And so when you say this is a lot like so-and-so season, you are, it's, it's this word called invoke. You're invoking a larger context that the average person would not be able to comprehend. And so in the New Testament, what they're doing is they are, what's called, a, they're, they're invoking the context of all these prophets. They might just mention, drop a, drop a word, drop a phrase, drop just a little hint. But what that does is it brings in this whole world of information for the first century reader who is familiar with those things, right? And so if we're not like in tune to that or, or 
uh, open to seeing that sort of thing, then we might miss over we might miss a lot of stuff just because we read through it. Oh, he changed the water to wine. That's pretty cool. Let's keep going. And not understanding that that's a reference to Isaiah chapter one and the restoration of Israel. So there's a lot going on in uh, John that we'll miss if we just read through it. You know, so you get, we got to slow down and try to figure out what where some of this comes from. Uh, why why did John say what he said? Because he said it specifically. He didn't just say it as you know thought it sound good. There's specific there's a specific point he's trying to make about who Jesus is and what he was doing in the world. So we got to slow down and read through it and pay special attention to all that. All right, anybody else have any have anything? <laughs>